Welcome everybody to Restoration Church Online. So glad that you've decided to join us today on July 19th. Oh, you did that a lot better. <laughs> My name is Ross. <laughs> Second I'm try. the pastor here. And I'm Emily. And she's Emily. Yeah. I'm the executive director. Mm -hmm. um, hey, if you've been around a little while, you're ready to let us know who you are. We'd encourage you to fill out this connection card. We'd love to get a gift in the mail to you, but perhaps even more importantly than that, um, we would love to connect with you mm -hmm. and to help you understand uh, who we are and what we're about and how you can maybe get involved. Plus, we give $3 to the Interfaith Food Alliance around here. So just by telling us who you are, you are helping those with food insecurity um, get a meal upon their table. So, And you might be new today because your kid or someone you know is part of Vacation Bible School this last week at Restoration. BBS. Rocky Railway 2020, virtual first ever yeah, virtual just, Vacation just Bible School. ended this week. Yep. We loved it. Yep. I thought it was really, it was awesome. really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, we need to give a huge shout out to Kate Haas, our Absolutely. director of kids yes. ministry. Mm -hmm. um, she did a phenomenal job pulling that all off. I will say that back when we were like realizing that COVID was going to impact Vacation Bible School, I was like, let's just cancel. There's no point. And she was like, we are not canceling. Yeah, yeah. She fought for it. <laughs> she did. And she did a fabulous job. And Rightfully so, so did. she fought for it. Yes. And yes. so it was a great, that was a good call. Yep. You know, um, we had 105 kids that registered. We had 58 families and 26 of those families were not regular restoration attenders. So if you're one of those, like, welcome. We're glad yeah. you're here today. Yeah, we love that. Um, we always love meeting new friends and welcoming new people to restoration. So mm -hmm. we had 14 crew leaders. So if you're a crew leader, you should give a little uh, chat over there because we we had the, I was going to say the best crew leader, but <laughs> all of our crew leaders are great. We yeah, had a awesome. really great crew leader. Thank you, Shan yes. Cook. She calls her crew the Skittle Crushers. And I've been eating my fair share of Skittles uh -huh. thanks to one of her yes. gifts to our kids. So. Yeah. so we are thankful for the crew leaders who kept in contact and making sure that our kids were engaging and, and having an adult you know, that was connecting with them. Mm -hmm. We had 14 volunteers who helped to pack and distribute materials. We had eight volunteers these volunteers are really important who came and recorded sessions for the program. Um, and one amazing decorator master, Heather McClay. Yes. Um, but the ones that came to record, you were one of those. I haven't seen your session yet. Mm -hmm. I can't was, wait to see that. I was one of them. But it's true. what, what was yeah. our reaction to the quality of our program? It we thought it was phenomenal. It was excellent. Yeah, it was like excellent. we were really impressed by like the camera presence of our people and the way that they, I mean, it's not easy, guys and girls, <laughs> to, to try to we reach make it through look the so screen. Easy, but yeah. it's really, no, we, we have a lot of practice doing yeah. this now. I, yeah. I don't even know how many Sundays we've ugh, done this, but see, there we go. But I, we just <laughs> want to give a shout out to all the people who gave yeah. their time, and, and some people gave and a the, lot of hours, some people gave a you know a little bit of time, but everybody who was on screen this last week, yeah, we give you a huge. Yes. High five and yes. a thank you for everything that you did. Yeah, it was really a phenomenal week. And you know what? It doesn't have to end necessarily because they are available until uh, August September. 11th. No. Mm -mm. Sorry, that's an update you don't know. Oh, okay. So Sorry. they're available one month from the day that they were like published okay. on one YouTube. Month. So, yeah. But you have a couple weeks to still, if you haven't finished yet, to wrap that up with your kids. We haven't finished yet because we are in the middle of baseball season. So, yes. Maybe we will have by Sunday. DBS know. though. Super, yeah. super. Awesome. Yeah, oh, it was such wait, a great week. I want to make Ross do something. So, Ross, Jesus' power pulls us through. Trust Jesus. <laughs> Here's the theme yeah, the kids learned, yeah, right? Uh, the, so the whole theme was how, how we are to trust him through all things, through the ups and downs of life. So here's what they talked about really fast. You have to say trust Jesus every time. Jesus' power helps us do hard things. Trust Jesus. Jesus' power gives us hope. Trust Jesus. Jesus' power helps us be bold. <laughs> trust Jesus. Which I heard was a favorite one. And Jesus' power lets us live forever. Trust Jesus. And here's a really important one. That Jesus was mine, I think. Jesus' power lets us live forever. I think so. And then Jesus' power helps us be good friends. Oh, I love Trust that. Jesus. Trust Jesus. Yes. <laughs> so, it was that's our pulling the train whistle, by the woo, way. Woo, woo, woo. There yes. you go. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you to Kate yes, and, and team. all the kids' leadership yeah. Yeah, who helped to pull that together Very and cool. make it possible for our families yes. and our kids of our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I said a lot of words really fast. What else do we <sighs> need to say? Well, we know that, okay, so, really so during during COVID, uh, during this whole pandemic, we know that 
Um, one of the great stresses, one of the great worries for a lot of people has been finances, mm -hmm. personal finances. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the next several weeks on our midweek platform, we are going to focus primarily on what the Bible has to say about finances. This is not like a, hey, you should give us your money. This is really right. about how we manage our money well. Um, like you, principles that will hopefully yeah, help Yeah, principles people. that will help us. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Because you may be finding that like you need to like redo your budget or yes. recalibrate because you lost one of your jobs or all of your jobs right. or you know right. so there may be adjustments you need to make and we would like to help you think through that mm -hmm. right yep mm -hmm. so um, be on the lookout for information about exactly when the time frame is um, but for the next several weeks on Wednesdays we are going to be focusing on that topic in particular and then after that we are going to jump into a conversation on. Marriage. Because we know that uh, that is one of those things that are under attack always, but certainly during this time, we know that that can be a struggle. It's a it's a ten, it's a well, tense, and I want to say too, whether you're married or not, or have plans to be or not, you're in relationship with people, mm -hmm. and so I'm guessing a lot of the principles that we talk about or things that we come up with will apply to everyone. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's a lot about how you treat one another. That's right. So. Stay money, marriage, money, marriage, two of the high stressors, stress mm -hmm. points uh, that we're hearing that we're about. Yeah. Hearing about. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to help you navigate some of that. So hope yeah. you can join us. Yeah, cool. Uh, speaking of uh, money, giving, what the Bible has to say about it, we believe that everything that we have has been entrusted to us. And so um, God has called us to be generous then, oh, no, generous managers. That, yeah. Generous, <laughs> no, you're going to make some faces for us. <laughs> yeah. uh, generous managers of what he has entrusted to us. So there are four very easy ways to give uh, to the cause of Christ here at Restoration Church. And thank you for the ways you're doing and that. Thank you absolutely yep. for the ways that you are mm -hmm. doing that. Um, you can give online, you can give through our app, you can give by texting a dollar amount to 84321, or you can give <laughs> by putting cash or check in an envelope and putting it in our box here at church or putting it in the mail box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a mouthful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Ross. Yeah. The governor made another statement about like meeting together this week. Yeah. And we know as a church that we are technically exempt from all of this, but we do want to be um, wise. wise and we want to love our community well. Yes. Because we also understand what I understood from what I listened to is that how we how the disease is controlled in Pennsylvania in the next weeks will really make an impact on schools on in the, the schools, fall. Yes. <clears throat> so, with that said, we are working on an August plan mm -hmm. that you'll know by the end of July. That's right. <laughs> we don't plan that <laughs> far out are. right now because when we do, things change. Yeah, and then... <laughs> yeah. Things things are changing yeah. weekly at this point. So yeah, we do have some tentative ideas about what August is going to look like, but um, we will let you know exactly what those are. Yeah. Uh, before July ends, so stay in yeah. touch. Stay and, in. and yeah, mm -hmm. not much. And yeah, but and our, yeah, we love yeah. all of our um, red, yellow, and green friends. And do. so Absolutely. some of our friends are today on the lawn at nine o'clock because mm -hmm. we had an outside. We're having an outside service, depending on when you're watching this. Um, but we're glad you're here with us online. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today, mm -hmm. and I'm excited for more Jonah. Are you going to get through more than three verses today? Uh, no. Oh, no. cool. But we are going to transition to a time of worship, and because this is this is a historically at Restoration Church, the VBS week, the week after VBS, mm, right. we uh, we worship by bringing the kids up. Of course, you can't do that this year, but we are still going to sing some of the songs that the kids sang this week. Yes, families, you families sing. This yeah, week well, so you VBS. can all get up and like move a little. Yeah, if you move want, a little bit. There's usually motions and yeah. some good stuff in there. So, so we will fun. see you back here. We do have a song at the end that Emily and I are going to do, but um. Mm -hmm. But worship along with our VBS. That's right. Uh, worship before, this week, right? Before we uh, get in the word together. Cool. All right. God bless everybody. We trust, we trust, we trust in you, Jesus, your own. You're all, you're all that we need Your power will pull us through We're trusting in you We're trusting in you You give us hope And life that's forever You make us bold And we stand together Your power will pull us through We're trusting in you We're trusting in you We're all fun 
this journey there's no looking back with jesus to lead us we're on the right track oh, 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 oh. wide open spaces for wide open eyes we're looking ahead for the next big surprise oh, oh, oh.
Today we are continuing the story of Jonah. Quick reminder that if you missed any week uh, of the series or you, or you missed any week of the series, you can always subscribe to our podcast. You can find these messages on our media tab of our website or even on Facebook or our YouTube channel. You can watch them if you miss a week. It's important because Jonah is a story and so we don't want you hopping in the middle of a story. So I would really encourage you if you do miss a week, make sure that you do catch yourself up. Now for those of you who were with us, you will remember Jonah was a prophet, but he was also a patriot of Israel. He loved his country. In fact, he loved it so much that he dismissed wickedness and he dismissed evil. He turned a blind eye to injustice so that his country might thrive and that his country might expand its borders. Ironically, God called this man to go and preach against those detestable and those horrible Assyrians. Jonah couldn't believe God wanted to save Israel's primary enemy, nor did Jonah believe that he would even be successful, and so instead of doing what God had told him to do, which is go to Nineveh, Jonah went in the exact opposite direction. He ran for Tarshish. This is where we pick up the story this morning. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, that is Tarshish. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee the Lord. Now, Jonah ran for roughly 30 miles, most likely on foot or by camel. He spent 
two days running, 60,000 steps he took, one after another, convinced and determined to run. 60,000 chances to turn around, to stop running. But he persisted in fleeing from the Lord. And I think that we have all done this. At some point in our lives, we have all done this. We may not have gone to this length, but we have all ran. When our insecurities are poked, when our idols are threatened, when guilt rises, when shame is exposed or responsibility is asked for, oftentimes we find ourselves running. Some of you may know the name John Christ. John Christ is a Christian comedian. He uh, makes his living by doing short skits and comedy routines primarily on the internet. But about eight months ago, he completely vanished. His presence completely vanished from the internet. And just this past week, he reappeared on the internet to explain what had happened, to explain where he had been. Eight months ago, it was discovered publicly that his private life was not matching his public life. In the video of which he was describing what happened, he calls himself the greatest of hypocrites. He knows this. He's aware of this. His private life was not matching his public life. And as part of his explanation, here's what he said. I I assumed that I lived in a community of people who would be the first to look down on me and judge me and point their fingers at me. So what do you do when you know that you're not living rightly, but if you are exposed, that you'll be torn apart. Well, you keep running. You keep hiding. You keep concealing. You you, you keep shoving down your guilt and and, and blame shifting. You, You live one way in public and you live another way in private. John continued by saying, at the beginning of this process, I wanted to hop on the internet and justify and rationalize and minimize and explain and defend myself. You see, something we don't often realize is that self-righteousness is also a form of running. See, fight or flight, these are often the, the two options that we're giving when we're met with conflict. Fight or flight Fighting is often a form of flighting as well. Fighting is just a different attempt at avoiding the real issue. If you think back to Adam and Eve, for instance, right, their first response to realizing that they're guilty and that their shame is being exposed, that their very first response is to flee, to run into the woods and to hide. Running and hiding is a natural reaction to being found out. It's a natural reaction to protect our idols and our insecurities and our feeble identities. And when Adam and Eve could no longer flee, what do they do? They begin fighting. We run, in other words, because it's a protective measure. Running away allows us to hide our face as we turn away from our problem or our punishment or our responsibility. And we can conceal our actions and we can conceal our intent. You see, to turn, to, to stop running and to turn and to face our color, or to face our problem, or to face our punishment, or to face our responsibility means that our problem, that our sin, that our shame, the thing that we're running from, the the thing that we are trying to conceal, that thing is going to be exposed. And in exposure, that is where shame lives, and that is where guilt rises. And and what if the, the one that we face, right, when we turn around, when we stop running and we face, what if the one that we face is not merciful? What if our problem is ruthless? What if our punishment is severe? And what if our responsibility is more than we can handle? I mean, that's scary. And it's uncertain, and it's out of our control. So a lot of people, they just keep running. And a lot of kids never grew up, and a lot of adults never really lived life. And step after step and mile after mile, we live fake lives full of false pretense, avoiding real issues, all the while clutching to idols and clutching to insecurities. See, John Christ, after eight months of treatment, after eight months of therapy, finally realized that he needed to own his sin, that he needed to confess it and expose it, and that this was the only path forward into freedom. 
he, he had to own up and admit and acknowledge the problems that were deep within his heart and deep within his mind and the corruption of his own soul. And he needed to say, I need to stop running. I need to let it lay bare upon the table. I need to be honest with myself and honest with the people I've hurt. I need to lay it all bare. I need to let it go. I need to put it out there. I need to be truthful. You see, he did the daring and the bold move of turning around. And in the fullness of truth, he was met with the fullness of grace. He let all of his sin out, and he had fully exposed and confessed before those he had abused and those he had wronged and those he had hurt. And he admitted his sin, and the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus freed him. My friends, this is the only pathway forward. The simple truth is that God wants more for us than a life of fight and flight. And so the Lord keeps running too. You know, one of the great themes of Scripture is that God draws near to us even when we are sinners, even when we have rejected him, even when we've rebelled against him and spat on him and fought him and cursed him. God draws near to us. God makes the effort to meet us where we are. One of the great summaries of the Christian message is found in Romans 5.8, that it was while we were still sinners that God demonstrated his own love for us by sending Jesus to die on our behalf. And there is now nothing, there is no action or behavior or thought or emotion or experience or distance that can separate us now from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God's love, in other words, will compel him to do radical things. When we are far from him, when we have ran and we are far from him, God's love will compel him to chase us down, to do radical things to bring us back to himself. He is not content with letting us die out there far from him. He is not content with seeing us live lives that are not in line with the abundance of life that he had designed us for. And so what does he do? Well, he chases us down. And sometimes, oftentimes perhaps, he does radical things to get our attention. He must do radical things to get our attention. It is his love compelling him to do this. It is an act of mercy when he does radical things to get our attention. In Jonah's case, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So to get Jonah's attention, God launched, or he hurled like a spear or a weapon, this storm. God used the storm as his radical intervention in Jonah's life. Now, so many people have asked me over the past four months, you know, we're in this global pandemic, and they're like, what the heck is God doing in this? What are we supposed to learn from this? What could God possibly be up to? As they have seen loved ones and friends become sick, and some of them have died from this disease, as many have lost jobs and many struggle to pay their bills, as domestic violence and suicide attempts have increased because of it, starvations and those who are hungry and struggling to put food on the table have risen exponentially during this time, stress and anxiety and fear and depression are on the rise across the board, and so many other horrible experiences are being had, and people are like, what the heck? God, what are you doing? Where are you, God? What are we supposed to learn from this? Where are you? Why aren't you doing anything to stop this? And my answer when I'm asked these questions every single time is, I don't know. But I do know, I do know that there is something that we are supposed to learn from it. I do know that there is something to be gained from this. I do know that it would be a shame if in the end we wasted this crisis. We are right now as a nation and a world in the middle of a storm. And one lesson, perhaps the most important lesson that we need to be learning from this is that there is a standard for human life ordained by our creator that we have largely ignored as a people upon this planet. And we didn't make this standard up. And we don't determine the standard, but deep within all of our hearts, we know that the standard is there. See, God created us to live and function in a particular way. Simply and primarily, he created us to live in love with him, and that love then, that love relationship was to be an overflowing experience 
experience of love upon the world around us, or, or simply put, we are to love God and love others. And when we do not live and function in love, it is God's merciful hand to do whatever is necessary to help us realize this and to help us turn around. You see, what Jonah didn't realize quite yet in the midst of the storm, and what we don't often realize in the midst of our storms, is that they are often God's hand of mercy trying to carve out sin and tear down idols. You see, God's design for human life is love. And when we live against love and against God, we are acting against the grain of the universe and our own design, and therefore we are also acting against our own well-being. And so what is God to do with his creation that is insistent on living in ardent opposition to the way that it was created? What is God to do in times like this? John Newton, you may know this name because he was the one who penned Amazing Grace. He grew up a very selfish, hardened individual, living a life of sin and manipulation and temptation and seduction. He worked as the captain of a trade of a slave trading vessel. And though his mother died when he was seven years old, he always had the scripture that she recited over him every evening burrowed deep within his heart and deep within his memory. And so one night in the middle of a great and terrible storm, raging upon the sea, threatening to destroy his life and threatening to destroy his ship, he realized how frail and feeble all of his pursuits are. He had been clinging to idols his whole life, and he realized that all of them were about to fail him in his time of trouble. All of his frail and feeble pursuits and how he had wasted his life. And in this moment, he cried out to God, and in that moment, God saved him. And John survived that experience, and he went on to become an Anglican minister of the gospel, and he wrote, again, one of the most classic of all hymns, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. He also said, that the greatest danger of all is that we never become aware of our blindness, pride, and self-sufficiency. If Satan would be happy to let you have a charmed and prosperous life for many years so that you don't see the truth until it's too late. However, God, out of love, wants to wake you up to your condition so you can do something about it. And in many lives and in many instances, God uses storms. It's not God's cruelty, but his mercy that sometimes makes life uncomfortable and challenging. There's an old fairy tale that I, I read this past week that explains how this can be the case. It goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a wicked witch who lived in a remote cottage deep in the forest. When travelers came through looking for lodging, she offered them a meal and a bed. It was the most wonderfully comfortable bed any of them had ever felt, but it was a bed full of dark magic. And if you were asleep in the bed when the sun came up, then you would be turned to stone and you would become a figure in the witch's statuary until the end of time. The witch forced the young girl to serve her, and though she had no power to resist the witch, the girl had become more and more filled with pity for her victims. One day a young man came looking for a bed and board and was taken in. The servant girl filled with love for the young man could not bear to see him turn to stone, so she threw sticks and stones and thistles into his bed. It made the bed horribly uncomfortable, and every time he turned, he felt a new painful object under him. And though he cast each one out, there was always a new one to dig deep into his flesh. He slept only fitfully and finally rose, feeling weary and worn long before dawn. As he walked out to the front door, the servant girl met him and berated her cruelly. How could you give a traveler such a terrible bed full of sticks and stones? He cried and he went on his way. Ah, she said under her breath, the misery you know now is nothing like the infinitely greater misery a comfortable sleep would have brought upon you. Those were my sticks and stones of love. You see, God sometimes, as an act of his mercy, puts sticks and stones, and storms of love into our lives to wake us up and to bring us to rely on him. He is chasing us down and doing everything in his power to bring us back to himself. 
For those of you who need the theological explanation of how this all works, C.S. Lewis, a great classic author, Christian, Christian author, uh, gives us this explanation as he wrote in The Problem of Pain. He said, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. See, God uses pain to teach us something. He uses storms to convince us that something isn't right with our current situation or our current circumstance. And we must pay attention lest we use, lose the value of the experience. But C.S. Lewis continues, Now God, who has made us, knows that we are, knows what we are, and that our happiness lies in him, in him alone. God is the only source of ultimate happiness, C.S. Lewis would say. Yet we will not seek it in him as long as he leaves us any other resort where it can plausibly be looked for. While, we, while what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. We will rather attempt to find life and joy and satisfaction in anything and everything else. We will cling to idols, and we will cling to our insecurities, and we will cling to our money and our stuff and our popularity and our security and anything else in life that might bring us some semblance of satisfaction. We will go looking for life in that. What then can God do? In our interest, but to make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible source of false happiness. See, pain, the, the storms of life, shatter all the false life in us. It convinces us that it's not worthy of our trust and love and hope and residency in our souls. When we put our trust and our life in our body image, for example, well, a scar might help us to realize that our bodies are feeble and they're frail and they're not an uh, appropriate uh, placeholder of our trust and of our life and of our identity. When we put our life and our trust and our money, well, losing our job might be what is necessary to help us realize that it is not an appropriate holder of our life. And when we put our life and our trust in our relationships, losing them might help us realize that we have placed our identity in something that is destined to die. We are perplexed, C.S. Lewis continues, to see misfortune falling upon decent, inoffensive, worthy people. On capable, hard-working mothers of families or diligent, thrifty little tradespeople. On those who have worked so hard and so honestly for their modest stock of happiness. This is really so many of us in this global pandemic, isn't it? I mean, we're enduring this pandemic thinking that we don't deserve this. We've worked hard. We're simple people. We're good who try to do what is right and good by others. We're not bad people. So why is this happening to us? Well, C.S. Lewis concludes by saying, Let me implore the reader to try to believe, if only for a moment, that God, who made these deserving people, may really be right when he thinks that their modest prosperity and the happiness of their children are not enough to make them blessed, that all of this must fall from them in the end, and that if they have not learned to know him, they will be wretched. Or in other words, there is no ultimate happiness outside of God. And if any attempt at finding ultimate happiness takes up real estate in our soul, then it is a merciful act of God to remove it. Now, here's what I don't want you to walk away thinking or understanding today. That money is evil, that stuff is bad, that all sex is bad, that all power is corrupt, and that it should all be avoided because if I find any enjoyment and any happiness— in any of it, then I am in opposition to God, and he is going to smite me and tear it out of me, hoping that I will then come crawling back to him. I mean, these are all good things. But when we make a good thing the ultimate thing, when, when they become our hope for happiness and our source for joy, when they become what we live for and what we seek, the life that only God can provide in them, when they become our idols, then it is a merciful hand of God to tear them down. Now Jonah, at this point in the story, he could not see God's mercy at work in the midst of this storm. He's eventually going to realize that it's going to take a more drastic experience for him to finally understand God's mercy at work. But right now, in the midst of this storm, there's still too much pride built up in his heart. And it's convincing him to keep running, and it's convincing him to keep his back turned towards God. 
And he's unable in this time in his life to learn the lesson that he needs to learn. And my friends, if we continue to refuse to humble ourselves, if we continue to refuse to believe and acknowledge that we are a runner and that our back is against God and that there are insecurities within us that we are determined to defend and that there are sins in our lives that we are determined to conceal and that there are responsibilities that we are determined to ignore, then it does not matter how many storms or to what severity those storms come. It does not matter what comes into your life. You will always run away. You will always self-pity. You will always rage. You will always blame. You will always fight. You will always question. And you will never grow to be fully human. But let this be one more lesson for us. You see, we know on, on this side of the cross that God saves through weakness and that God saves through suffering and that God saves through apparent defeat. You see, those who watched Jesus die saw nothing on that Friday evening but loss and tragedy and sorrow and defeat and darkness and ruin and despair. There was no silver lining or glimmer of light on that Friday of Jesus' death. But it was here, in the heart of darkness, that the, the divine mercy was so powerfully at work, bringing pardon for sin and forgiveness for the sinner. See, God's salvation came into the world through suffering, and so his saving grace and power can only work in our lives as we go through difficulty and sorrow as well. The storms are necessary, my friends. How many people do you know that turn to Jesus on the good days? The, the people that we know who are self-sufficient, the people who we know who are living with a silver spoon in their mouth, the people who we know who have it all together and they have no worry in the world, why would they ever turn to Jesus? Why would they ever seek out a life of faith? It is when life seems to crumble that most people turn to God. Salvation comes through suffering. It comes through the suffering, the weakness of Jesus Christ as his blood was shed on the cross and his body was broken upon the cross. You see, God went into the worst of all storms and he let it do its absolute worst to him. But Jesus came out victorious on the other side and my friends, I believe that we will do the same when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. When we are in the midst of storms, when we stop running and we stop concealing and we turn towards God in humility and say, God, here it is. Here's my life. That's all on the table for you to see. I'm not going to hide it any longer. I'm not going to run anymore. I'm going to let myself be exposed. And as scary as that may be, God, I'm going to face you head on. Here is the truth about who I am, God, and you promise that you will then meet me with the fullness of grace. The fullness of truth is always met with the fullness of grace. You see, God is willing to do anything and everything to chase us down in order that we might live. Not that so we might live a shallow, false life that's merely a shadow of the life that we are created for, but that we might live an abundant life overflowing life that God had always designed for us. And I hope that in the midst of whatever storm you're going through, whatever fear or worry or anxiety or stress is knocking on your door right now, I hope that whatever storm you are going through, you can believe that God is for you, that he is with you, that he is on your side, but that you must stop running. And that you must stop concealing. And that if you would merely turn around and offer your life in the fullness of truth, my friends, you will be met with the fullness of grace. And the power of God's salvation will carry you through every single storm. I'm going to say a prayer for you. 
And if you pray along with this prayer, I would just encourage you to hit the button that's on the screen. If you're on our online platform, if you're watching on Facebook, throw, throw up an emoji on, in, in the comments because we want to connect with you and we want to follow up with you. We want to help you in your pursuit of Christ to become more like him and in the midst of those storms to find a very firm foundation that can outlast any storm that you go through. So I'm going to say a prayer for us, and I encourage you to pray along with me, and then let us know that you prayed with us so that we can be in touch with you. And then I'm going to offer a few discussion questions so that hopefully we can continue this conversation today and throughout the week. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, me, this is Ross speaking to you. I, I feel like Jonah so often. I feel like you have a calling upon me and that you have something that you're asking of me to do, a life that you have called me to live and, and I refuse it. That sin somehow grips me and convinces me to conceal and to run away and to hide. And right now, Father, I want to admit that I am a sinner and that I have rejected you and abandoned you, Father. And I turn towards you in repentance. I, I turn from my sin and I, and I repent of it, Father. I say, I do not want to live that life anymore. I'm not going to keep running, Father. I'm turning. And in the fullness of my revelation, Father, that I am a sinner and I lay it all on the table before you. Meet me with your grace as you have promised to do. Meet me with your love to sustain me. Meet me with your power to carry me through every single storm. Thank you for your mercy that does not give me what I deserve. Thank you for your grace that forgives me. Thank you for your love that sustains me. And thank you for your presence, Father, and your power that carries me. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you would like to continue this conversation, we would encourage you to engage with us online, on Facebook, email, or even at your dinner table tonight or at lunch today, you could have these conversations. Here are a couple discussion questions to help you with that conversation. First, in what ways have you run from God? As you think about your life and you think about what God has called of you, the life that God has designed you to live, in what ways have you run from God? Second, why is turning back to God such a bold and courageous move? After acknowledging that we're running, after acknowledging that we're sinners, why is turning back to God such a bold and courageous move? Third, if you've done so, if you've turned back around, what has been your experience of exposing your truth? Was your truth met with grace or was it met with judgment? Because it's easy to confess and it's easy to acknowledge our sin in the confines of a closet. Between me and God, that's fine. But what about when I expose my truth to other people? What about when my sin is revealed to a community of people that I've sinned against? What about when the people that I have hurt are in front of me and I have to confess that? Have you ever done that? And when you did that, were you met with grace or were you met with judgment? We are hoping to be a church that meets people with grace, understanding, we talk about this all the time, understanding that we are the worst of all sinners, that I, Pastor Ross, yes, the leader of this congregation, that I am the worst of all sinners this is the perspective that we need to take. And the grace of God has met me where I am at. And so then I must then meet all other people with the grace that God has offered me. We would encourage you to join us to be part of this community if you're already not, because, my friends, understanding that there is a grace-based community will help you transform into the image of God. Last question for you today. How has God used the painful experience in your life to get your attention? And did he have to carve out some sin? And did he have to tear down some idols in that process? So I hope these discussion questions are helpful to you. Again, engage with us online. Or I hope that you can engage at your table with your friends and your family. We're going to sing one final song as we conclude our time together. We hope that this song will be a blessing to you. We hope that it will be a song that speaks to you. And if you're unfamiliar with it, I would encourage you to just pay attention to the lyrics.
Wake me up from my slumber, oh God. Take these shaking hands and hold them still. Wake me up from my slumber, oh God. Lift my eyes to yours, where my help comes from. Over and over again, your love and your mercy begin. No matter how far you find me where I am When my fears chase my failures Oh God Oh when heaven's glory seems so far Wake me up to your glory, oh God, draw my eyes to yours, where my help comes from. I will find you over and over again, your love and your mercy begin, no matter how far you find me where I am. Over and over again, your love and your mercy begin. No matter how far you find me where I am, in my suffering and in my weakness, and when from you I ran, you find me in the dark of sin when I'm there. Find me over and over again. Your love and your mercy begin. No matter how far you find me where I am. Over and over again. Your love and your mercy begin. No matter how far you find me where I am Wake me up through your glory, oh God Draw my eyes to yours where my help comes from Hey, thank you again for joining us today on this online platform. We highly encourage you to join us next week on, again, this online platform at 9 or 10.30. As we be continue the story of Jonah, Jonah is about to hop on that boat, right? The storm is going to continue to rage, but he is not alone on the boat. There are other people who he has to now interact with who are caught up in the storm caused by his sin. And isn't that often the case? We live in a fallen and a broken world. We may not have caused the storms, but we live amid, uh, amongst them. And so we're going to venture into the story of the sailors and how they interact with Jonah and his storm next week. Hope to see you there. God bless.